What was the largest amount of uh, money anyone ever gave you to wash? Three million. That three million that, was. That three million. Yeah. Which they, was... they wanted to do a lot. But remember, we don't want to facilitate. So right. we don't want to get into like, let's do five million. And, and just also think this. The bad guys knows that we do this. You know, bad guys, the Colombians are very smart and the Mexicans. So what they knew is that they know how the government works. So if they get, they could allow one shipment in and then the next one they'll get. So sometimes you hear when we did background checks that DEA worked these guys and they disappeared and they show up. So you have to be able to see how they operate. They're very smart of saying, okay, I know the government's going to let the first one fly. So we'll do one and then we'll skip it. So wow. they're, they were using your resource. They were leveraging you and using your resources to get their criminal enterprises facilitated. Exactly. Knowing that you were potentially the police. Yes, exactly. And, and, and then break out. Don't yeah, come back. Exactly. And there were times <laughs> when you were out at sea, right, when the Coast Guard, we have information, such and such a boat is carrying dope. The Coast Guard hits it. They got boats, right? And they're high-fiving each other and everything. Meanwhile, five or six boats are coming by, loaded right. to the max. Right, right. You know, yeah. it, it took yeah. us... Yeah, we, we always knew that. We always yeah. knew that. Can you imagine <laughs> that? It's like, it, it always worked. I mean, it's it's always clever, it, it, the things that they come up with. So, you know, it was like playing uh, chess with them. You know, one right. move, the other, what are they up to, what they're doing... Uh, it was just a, and that's why I always give them more credit than the mob. Because number one, they made more money than the mob. Number two, I think they're more treacherous than the mob. I mean, look at the Mexican cartel chopping heads off and putting them on top of fences. I was, that was in Laredo City. I was in Laredo giving a presentation when that happened. And, uh, look at, uh, they killed the family. I remember early on the investigation, if you were an informant, you had to tell the bad guy what your family was all about. So the mob doesn't do that. The mob wants to kind of keep family away. It's just the individual. But uh, you're dealing with a ruthless, uh, very treacherous uh, group that makes more money. And people, are, but it's not romanticized or glorified like the mob is, like the Sopranos, everybody's seen the Godfather, Bronx Tale. But meanwhile, mm. You got these Mexican cartel and Colombians, they just they, they just could take them and destroy them if they want to. I remember right. had guys following the mob guys. And if they lose them, they'll find them. They're either at their Kumada's house, which is their yep. girlfriend. They're at their mom's house. They're at the social club. You Once they see, you know, like the Colombians call it una cola. Cola means a, a, a tail. Once they see the cola... They disappear into the wind. And they either go to California, they get a rain, rain some new set of IDs and go. Very clever. Because, right. you know. Um, there's another paragraph in your book that goes, we had seized well over $3 million in drug proceeds. Since we were working with the New York City police on that case, they got 10 or 20% of the money. That's, how, that's the way it works. Can you tell us how the confiscated cash is shared between the law enforcement agencies? It's an incentive that we give to, to the uh, PD. They work hand in hand with us. Once they are cleared in the FBI, they have access to wherever in the FBI. And what it works out that it's called a DAG, I think, uh, memory serves me, is that they can put in for a percentage of the seizure and that the NYPD gets it. We in the FBI don't get that money. That money goes into the fund, that government GSA fund. So we never see that. So the PD guys are the ones that look like rock stars because they go back to their chiefs and the commissioner, look what I did for the NYPD. We bought a couple of million, you know, and we did that with all the cases. They uh, always got a part of our money and it's something that's agreed to in a uh, memorandum of understanding. But that in itself kept in mind that we were the lead agency, no matter what. So if we came into dispute, 
uh, we would always win because we're the guys who are giving you the car, the overtime, and this day. I mean, and but the PD was very, you know, happy with... Uh, we had another mob case with the PD where uh, this great detective, um, uh, D. Christina, we used to call him D, posed with this big cartel guy. They seized all kinds of money. And he wound up looking like a rock star. But meantime... He didn't get anything for that, not not any special award or anything by the NYPD uh, for obtaining such a large cash thing for the uh, for the NYPD. Mm-hmm. It's just something that goes. It didn't bother us because we knew that we weren't getting it anyway. So if they were able to get new cars and new overtime, God bless them. Amado Carrillo Fuentes, you your team seized 11 million in cash from him, 7.4 tons of cocaine and 2,400 pounds of marijuana. Yeah. Who was he and, and what what do you believe ultimately happened to him? Well, I never met him, of course, because usually you meet to sell his representatives that you deal with. But uh, my understanding, he was a, a ruthless uh, a leader, but also one that I believe got a plastic surgery uh, to change his look, but the plastic surgery went bad and he died. And the mob wound up killing, the the Mexican mob killed the doctors who did it. He was trying to change his appearances, I guess with all the money that he had. Mm -hmm. So so if if it failed, um, then why would they kill the uh, all the doctors that were involved like that seems like something more so to keep them from telling anybody what the result of their work well, was that was one but also the fact that they did a botched up job the guy died from a result of it so they mm. killed they don't you know, they these drug dealers are sicarios you know mm-hmm. they they just don't care they just like killing people you know it's uh it's where they got their jollies they dealing with them is very dangerous and uh just like the movie Sicarios, I don't know if you've seen those. Mm-hmm. Yep, of course. You know, it's kind of like that. Benicio del Toro, and uh, they're ruthless people. But originally, I thought they killed him, like you said before, because nobody. And that could be wrong, because again, I never dealt with him, but I do know there was plastic surgery done as a result of it, either maybe before or after. Are you aware of anything about that at all? The not... I mean, you know, there's always been the rumor that. Um, they swapped out someone else and that it was never really his intention to get the surgery. They just made it look like it was him getting the surgery and then faked his death. They, at some point, I guess somebody figured it would be easier for him to fake his death and get a new identity and just dis- disappear somewhere rather than actually subject himself to being um, cut up and stuff like that and then had the healing time. And then these people still knew who he was. They still had to die. They knew what changes they had made. So this, it, a lot of a lot of people just believed that he pretended that he attempted it and died in the process and then killed anybody who knew. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, it could be. Uh, I, I'm gonna when we finish here, I'm gonna look him up again, see uh, if my sources yeah, say anything. Comes up. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting, man. Yeah, but um, those. Does the ATF and the DEA run money laundering operations like the ones you were involved in, independent of the FBI? Yes. Um, that's the worst part about working in New York. We go do a, a job. Sometimes you'll see cars and old police cars. They, some reason or other, they like getting tinted windows. Like, who else gets tinted windows but a cop does, you know? Right. So you start seeing, like, police activity, cops rounding. So our guys, the backup guys, would confront them, and they turn out to be either from ATF. Well, we're here because our source is meeting with this big money launderer. Oh, we know him as Manny. That was me. So then we just go back to the office. It was a dry run. But if you look at New York, you got customs working dope. ATF, DEA, NYPD narcotics, FBI, and the list goes on. All the alphabet agencies are involved and everybody's doing dope because dope brings you a lot of stats and dope also brings you money that you wind up looking good to the bosses and bodies that show arrest. So it was a tough environment to work in. I mean, uh, but they do, they're all working 
Same thing we're doing, they're doing it on a different scale. Right. Um, in your book, you also said the banks have to have some idea of what these millions and millions of dollars they are transmitting on behalf of the dopers back to their native countries must, be, must represent. And yet they turn a blind eye because they're getting paid. How long had you been an FBI agent before you started realizing that? Oh, that was right at the outset. I mean, look at Miami. And then in the 80s, Miami blossomed. And I was working cases down here, too. And they had so many banks that were open, just like the movie Scarface. So many banks that were being open. So many people, like the case that I worked at, Kings of uh, uh, Cocaine Cowboys, Kings of Miami. These guys, they wanted the world. They were like John Gotti, celebrity gangsters. They wanted everybody to know who they were. They drove to fancy cars with gold inlay. And they deposited, I mean, the difference was the Cubans, we ain't going anywhere. So those drug dealers, kings of Miami, were here in the U.S., where the Colombian people, they all want to go back. All the money leaves America. So I realized that early on when you started seeing the skyline, of Miami and seeing all the dope that was coming in here and all the money that was being made in Miami um, had to be put somewhere. And people, I guess, turned a blind eye to it. Uh, prior to coming to the conclusion that the system was inherently corrupt, had you heard other, uh, perhaps more seasoned agents expressing such frustrations? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, they said that sometimes the bank doesn't do what they're supposed to do. And the other thing was that they're not as cooperative uh, as they are with us. We have to usually serve subpoenas. So some places we go, they'll let you, they'll answer your questions. But other times, well, you need to get a subpoena for us to give you those records. So uh, there was always that frustration uh, with dealing with the banks. And then also the bank has a way of notifying the client and tell them we're investigating them. So that puts us in the trick bag. So right. if you're a drug dealer and you get out, the FBI is looking at your records, you know, poof into the wind or something else. Right. right. Um, in, in that same paragraph, uh, you go on to say, quote, it's tough to have a war on drugs when practically everyone is bought off, either under the table or, in the case of the banks, in a totally legal manner. Um, are, are you willing to share your honest thoughts about the quote unquote war on drugs? The war on drugs is never ending. Uh, I, I really believe that I, uh, and you're probably going to laugh. I think the best thing that ever happened, but unfortunately it didn't catch on is when, uh, Mrs. Reagan said, we have to teach our kids to say no to drugs. And if you get them at an early age where they learn about drugs, they learn all about what it could do, what it has done, as they grow, maybe they won't be involved in it. Because in the 80s, it, drugs was the place to go. How many times would you go to the bathroom and you hear, you see three guys in the bathroom? Oh, well, you know, you're saying, what the heck is going on in, in the there? Stall. Yeah. The guys come out, they all got their noses all blown. They're talking to you like, you know. <laughs> stoned out of their mind. They're taking the little tube. It, the war on drugs, just we couldn't be. And then, you know, uh, there was also the problems with the, in, um, in Nicaragua with the Sandinistas and the dope coming in where traded for weapons, you know, started getting on that political part of it. Uh, and it brought a lot of people and it destroyed a lot of people. Uh, I mean, I know friends of mine that I played football with who have been totally destroyed. And they were very well to do. And now they have nothing because they had this addiction to uh, to cocaine. And so the war on drugs is even to this day, there'll always be a new drug like fentanyl. That was mm -hmm. never around when I was around. We never mm -hmm. I never even heard of fentanyl. Then, of course, uh, towards the end, we had ecstasy. Uh, and and every they'll find the drug because they know there's a market. So when Miss Reagan said no to drugs, is wants us all to it's su supply and demand. We d we want that drug, so therefore we they're sending it here. But if it wasn't a market here, they'll send it to wherever there's a market. That's right. 